All right, hello and welcome everyone. I see it is now uh, one o'clock central time. So it is time for us to start our webinar. Thanks to everyone who had time to join us. We hope that you'll enjoy today's talk. We'll be welcoming Don Brandstratter and Valerie Brady. Um, they're going to talk about their work with Spiny Water Flea, presenting their uh, presentation, which is Line Snag Spines, Preventing the Spread of Spiny Water Flea. I'm going to give a couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started, and then I'm going to pass it on over to Don for the presentation. Um, so everyone will be on mute for the duration of the webinar. If you have questions for Don and Val, you can enter those into your chat box, um, and you should see that now. Um, there's a graphic on the screen to kind of show you where to, where to find that. Um, if you could use that. Um, that feature for the questions, that would be perfect. We'll be tracking those and we'll ask those um, once the presentation is over. We have usually about a half hour of time, um, give or take, uh, at the end for questions. Um, if you run into any issues, if you're having some technical problems, if you can get to the chat, um, you can enter your question or your issue there and we'll try and help you through it. Um, if that isn't working, feel free to email Pat Mulcahy. Um, he's our program coordinator and also helps with out, out with the kind of the tech assistance throughout this. Um, so his email address is mulcahyp at umn.edu um, and he'll, he'll watch his inbox as, as we go throughout the webinar. So you can, you can shoot him a message there and he'll try and help you out. Um, finally, we will be recording this webinar. So um, if you aren't able to make it throughout the whole thing or you end up joining in late or have some uh, connection issues throughout, don't worry, we'll have that posted. Um, we'll add that into our YouTube channel. It usually takes about a week um, for that to happen, um, give or take, it's a long weekend. So um, we'll, we'll send out a notice when that is ready. So with that, um, I'll be shutting my video feed off and I'm going to turn this over to Don and let him share his screen and start the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. I wanted to just say thank you to uh, Megan and Pat for this invitation and for setting this up. Um, I'm gonna share my screen now. Let's see. This says host disabled participant screen sharing. So. I think Pat will be able to update that setting from his side. Okay. Should be updated now. I'll give it another try. Yep. There we go. Okay. Is that? Uh, yep, we're good. Okay. okay, great. Um, so, uh, uh, thank you for uh, joining today. Um, this is a big project that's co-sponsored by St. Louis County and the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species uh, Research Center. Um, I'll be presenting, and Val Brady is on deck. Um, to uh, present if the internet access uh, starts to um, starts to have issues. Okay, so here's a scenario um, that I want you to take a look at, um, one that you're probably quite familiar with. Uh, you're leaving a lake after a day of fishing. Uh, now what, right? What to do? One of the things is you're visually reminded by that orange sign in the back. Um, that this lake supports spiny water flea, perhaps additional aquatic invasive species. And you're reminded either in your mind um, or maybe a bumper sticker on your pickup truck uh, about the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign, clean, drain and dry. So this is a critical moment in the life of spiny water flea and perhaps most, if not all, aquatic invasives because we know that human transportation vectors are a leading pathway of AIS dispersal. And so it's also an equally critical moment for you as a user of a lake resource to break this bridge of dispersal between lakes. Now it ends up that spiny water flea pictured there at the bottom is really quite good at hitchhiking or ensnaring on angling equipment. 
And we can sort of ask why that is. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is its small size. There it is pictured on a fingertip on the left there. And it bears this long stout tail spine. And both of these characteristics make it vulnerable to ensnarement in pockets of water. So for example, bait buckets and live wells, as well as on lines and ropes. So angling and anchor lines. To help understand and highlight where and when the highest risk is likely to occur at this moment, um, we proposed this project and, uh, and it was funded. And we proposed five questions that, uh, that I'm gonna attempt to, to show you some empirical evidence for today. The first question is, is, is ensnarement risk different among gear types? The second is ensnarement risk affected by lake density the third is, in, is ensnarement risk lake specific, and I'll describe the details of that in just a minute and why we picked the two lakes that we did. Um, is ensnarement risk life stage specific? And is ensnarement risk time of day specific? Um, now, um, I, I don't want to uh, cut right to the, right to the conclusion, uh, but I'm going to, um, just to highlight what our evidence shows based on our project. We found confirmatory evidence, you could say, for the first five questions. We found differences among gear type. We found that ambient density in the lake was a positive predictor of ensnarement. We found eight, one at least significant difference between the two lakes, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and why that might be. We found that there's evidence for life stage specificity. That is, some life stages are more likely to ensnare than others. But based on our analysis, we really didn't find confirmatory evidence that there was an effect of time of day on the, the general uh, effect uh, and patterns of ensnarement that we attempted to measure. So here's the outline that I'm, I'm going to follow today. I, I know we have a big cross section of folks uh, online here in terms of their um, understanding of bithytrephes. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about its basic biology. And then I'll present the methods to the project. And then I'm going to couple a live survey. So we're going to have some survey questions that you respond to. And um, incrementally, as you respond to those, I'll share the results, the empirical results of what we found. Um, and then finally, we'll wrap up by talking about uh, one of the outreach products that is a culmination of the, uh, of the project that we're just in the process now of, of uh, finishing the design on and getting ready to produce it. All right. So, now, a common misconception about the spiny water flea is that it's a flea and an insect. And um, in fact, it's neither of these. It's not a flea or an insect. Um, if we look at kind of the, a rough tree of life here, uh, it, it's close, but it's, but it's not. It's a crustacean, which is a, a freshwater and marine grid. It, it includes a wide variety of, of organisms that you're familiar with, like crayfish, and shrimp. But the spiny water flea and its relatives, or the common water flea, uh, derive their name from their swimming motion, which is, is kind of erratic and jerky um, as a result of the, uh, the use of their, their second antennae. Um, th this is another interesting component to the <clears throat> biology of of bithytrephes or spiny water flea, which I'll use interchangeably here. Um, this is the developmental sequence of the organism as it goes from its earliest life stage to its mature adult life stage. And, and so they start life as a juvenile, which you can see on top there. And then we call that instar one. And even at that, that age, from birth, they have a relatively long tail spine. Okay. Now, under ideal growing conditions, temperature, food, uh, and so forth, within a couple of days, they can, they can grow and recruit into instar two 
And they lengthen the tail spine at that point by adding an intercalary segment of exoskeleton and a, and a second pair of barbs. And then within a day or two, under ideal conditions, they become a mature adult. And, and during that instar two, and particularly instar st three stage, you can see the, uh, the development of a brood chamber on the dorsal side. And, and that would typically bear anywhere between one and four or five offspring that within a week to a week and a half, um, they would all hatch and complete the life cycle. So this is a very fast growing organism and when growing conditions are good, their populations can increase in an, in an exponential fashion. Okay, so this third and final slide regarding background really is meant just to, to underscore the fact that we now have overwhelming empirical evidence that when spiny water flea enters a lake, it, it changes the native food web. And it does so in a, in a variety of ways. If we look at these boxes here, what they represent is a is sort of a traditional food chain going from phytoplankton or algae at the base of the food chain with an arrow pointing to native zooplankton, just indicating that energy and nutrients are typically moving in that direction and the native zooplankton serve as a foundation, energy and nutrients for planktivorous fish, like perch, for example, which then serve as the resource foundation for sport fish like walleye or piscivores. And spiny water flea or bithotrephes is a, is a zooplanktivore. It's a carnivore, just like perch and other small fish. It feeds on native zooplankton. And as a result of that, essentially steals energy and nutrients from planktivorous fish and shuttles own, those into its own growth and development. And as a result of that, it burns up a lot of extra energy, a lot of that original energy that could be used by planktivorous fish. And some fish, if they're large enough, can uh, feed on spiny water flea, overcoming the tail spine. But even so, a lot of the energy that would normally pass directly to them, that is the fish from native zooplankton, is metabolized by bifitrephes. So we know now, based on repeated studies, that native zooplankton abundance and productivity decline wholesale after spiny water flea invades, and it doesn't take long. Within a, a, a growing season or two, we see these shifts. We know, based on a couple published papers, that Planktivorous fish and piscivorous fish grow slower. And we know through some studies that algae may begin to accumulate faster as a result of a collapse in the native zooplankton. So there's a variety of ecosystem services, among them sport fishing quality and water quality that change in response to spiny water flea invasion. Okay, so now I wanna transition into the methods of this project. And this image here kinda of in, in, in one shot gives you a sense of an overview, I guess, of, of what we did. Our approach was to take a variety of common forms of angling gear and go out to a couple different lakes and use them the way anglers would use them, but with a really, a very repeated systematic uh, approach to this, and I'm going to talk about that systematic approach as well as the types of gear and how we use them in more detail in just a moment. But the point is we would use these gear and then we would retrieve them to the boat and collect all the spiny water flea associated with them, preserve them in ethanol, and take those samples back to the laboratory for identification and workup. So I'm gonna pivot now and talk first about the two lakes that were the focus of this study and, and how we went about systematically sampling these two lakes. The two lakes that we used were Island Lake Reservoir, which is located just north of Duluth by about 18 to 20 miles, and then Lake Millax down in the central portion of the state. We studied Island Lake in 2017 and 
mill wax in 2018. And we chose these two lakes for a couple of reasons. One, they both had established populations of spiny water flea. They're both recreational magnets for, for angling um, as well. And the other reason we chose them is that they had an interesting contrast in their fish communities. And so Cisco, which is a deep cold water zooplanktivore and feeds on spiny water flea, is that was absent is absent from Island Lake, but present in Max. And there were some interesting studies coming out of Ontario that demonstrated in lakes with Cisco, spiny water flea tend to reside higher, shallower in the in the water column than in lakes without Cisco, almost definitely as a way to avoid being seen and eaten by Cisco. So we thought this would uh, offer an interesting contrast because various forms of angling gear uh, ride shallow and other forms of angling gear tend to uh, transcend the entire water column. Down in the lower left is a map, kind of an overview, uh, sort of a rendering of the bathymetry of Island Lake. And you can see superimposed on that three lines, which are transects. So we established three different trans three transect lines in each lake, and we repeatedly went back to those throughout August and September in the year that we studied that lake. We uh, we um, accomplished 36 transects per lake uh, for the year that we studied that lake, and each transect was a kilometer in length. Most of the equipment, aside from the anchor ropes, was towed or trolled from a boat along that transect. And we moved at a speed of about three kilometers per hour. So it took us about 18 to 20 minutes to cover a transect. The anchor ropes were positioned in a stationary fashion at the beginning of each transect. You can see transect A to C, C to E, and then E to G. And you can see where the anchors were located in a pod of three at the start of each of those. And from this, then we could measure what we called ensnarement rate, which is our proxy for risk. And we're just calling ensnarement rate the number of spiny water flea ensnared per transect. So this slide here then shares a little bit more detail about the gear and somewhat about how we deployed it. So we had three stationary anchor ropes as I've just mentioned, deployed at the start of each transect. We had two nylon and one polypropylene product showed there. The nylon was a twisted in the left and a braided product in the middle and the polypropylene was a twisted product on the right. We had three shallow uh, angling lines that were trolled, a monofilament, a braided, and a fluorocarbon. Each line was paid out 35 feet about 11 meters and there was a weight on the end and we did some predetermination in, in the lakes and found that at the speed we were traveling and the weight and so forth and so on that these these weights were traveling at about 10 feet or three meters depth in the water. So we also had one moving downrigger cable um, and one attached monofilament line running from the surface to the bottom. We had a shallow moving bait bucket which was being trolled off of the starboard side of the boat. And then we had one live well simulation, which we accomplished by continuously pumping water from near the surface of the lake into a net. And the pump rate was about 14 liters per minute. So, so we pumped maybe a quarter of a cubic meter or something in that neighborhood. Okay, one other component to the methods that's important to understand is that we, we also measured the ambient natural lake density of spiny water flea at the time of every transect. And we did this through a second boat. And so this is an aerial view here of the gear towing boat in the, on the right here, the lower right, and the uh, spiny water flea density measuring boat, I guess you could call it, on the left there. And so within about five to 10 minutes of the gear deployment boat passing a location along the transect, the second boat tended up to that location and used these half meter diameter nets in triplicate to measure water column densities of spiny water flow. We, we measured that at the beginning, the middle and the end of each transect and then average those 
to for a single value of ambient density during the during the time of the transect. Now let's move to the results. Um, and this is where uh, you're going to you're going to become involved here um, to uh, to use your sort of your experience and, and inference and uh, whatever else you might want to bring to this. Maybe you've seen this talk before um, to uh, to kind of weigh in on what you think the risk is low, medium, or high for each of these gear types. So I've already told you that ensnarement risk is different among the gear types. Um, and what we're going to do sort of next, I'm going to show one more slide and then, and then Pat is going to uh, engage the survey. And I'm going to ask you one question at a, t at a time to rank the ensnarement risk of these different gears. And, and kind of just, I want, there's three choices. There's going to be low, medium, or high. Um, and it's just an estimate of how many spiny water flea you think that the gear ensnared uh, compared to the other gear. Okay. And I, ju I just want to um, also prompt you by, uh, by letting you know that for the anchor ropes, I just want you to consider one rope only, not all three together, right? And then for the shallow moving angling line, which is the second question, I just want you to consider just, just one of the lines, what the average would be. So we're just comparing one of each gear type to, to each other. Okay, so this is the table uh, and have Pat now um, ask the first question. Okay. Oh, awesome. Okay, so, so the the, I think everybody can see that. Um, everybody went with medium, or excuse me, about a, a third of the, the group, maybe half the group went with medium and uh, half the group went with either low or high. Okay, so let's look at what we found now. Um, we found low. In fact, we found very low. Um, of the 108 anchors that we deployed in Island Lake, over 36 transects, we did not detect a single spiny water flea on the anchor rope. And I'll talk a little bit more about anchor ropes and what we did find on the anchor ropes in, in a bit here. In Lake Mille Lacs, we found only three spiny water flea amongst all the anchor ropes that, that we deployed. It's very low. All right, next, I'm gonna have, a, have you weigh in on the shallow angling line. Cool. Okay, a, a more high than medium than low, but close to, to maybe 30% in each of those categories. Okay, let's look at what the science tells us. The science tells us it's high, um, in, in, quite high, in fact. So what this is telling us is that an Island Lake Reservoir, on average, a single shallow angling line across all 36 transects netted 12.5 spiny water flea. In Lake Mille Lacs, a single shallow angling line picked up 37 and a half spiny water flea on average across the study. Okay, next let's go with the downrigger cable. So this is the stainless steel cable that runs from the lake surface to within about a meter of the bottom. Sixty percent low, twenty-four percent medium, and fourteen percent high. Okay, so there was a, a sense that the downrigger cable was not nearly as high of a risk as the shallow angling line. 
Okay, it was medium, um, at least with respect to comparison of the other gear types in this project. Um, in Island Lake Reservoir, the downrigger cable ensnared about one spiny water flea per transect on average, and in Lake Mill Lax, it ensnared about six on average. So definitely more than anchor ropes, but not nearly as, as high as the number ensnared on the shallow angling line. Excellent. Okay, so the, the fourth gear type is the downrigger line. So I'll just, I'll just prompt, remind you again, I don't know if I actually said this originally, but the downrigger line that we used was monofilament. Okay, it was the exact same Berkeley product that we used for the shallow angle line. Okay, high. 61%, medium 27%, low 13%. Okay, excellent. It'd be interesting to know if the order of these questions bears on a response. I'm sure you've learned something, hopefully already, uh, that the, if the shallow angling line is a risk, probably the downrigger angling line is as well. And if that was your, um, if that was your logic, you were spot on. It was also very high. And I'm going to come back to this. This is interesting. In, in Island Lake Reservoir, the downrigger monofilament line ensnared three times more than the shallow angling line, whereas in Lake Mill Lax, we saw the reverse. I characterized both of these as high because that's the way the numbers played out, but there was an interesting uh, reciprocal trend with respect to the number ensnared on the shallow versus what you could call the, the deep angling line. Okay, next let's go with the bait bucket. Okay, bait bucket, 46% low. 36% medium and 18% high. So let's take a look at the results. Low, um, which is what most of you chose, which is excellent. Um, but look, quite low. Um, so again, in Island Lake Reservoir, we didn't find a single spiny water flea that became caught up in, in the bait bucket. Um, and the bait bucket didn't have bait in it, so we know that uh, minnows weren't eating the spiny water flea if they entered. In Lake Mill Lax, we found a single spiny water flea associated with the bait bucket. So like anchor ropes, both, uh, uh, both lakes demonstrated bait buckets as a relatively low risk. Okay, then finally the live well. So this was the simulation where we pumped water from the side of the boat directly into a net. Okay, excellent. 41% low, 35% medium, and 24% high. Boy, there's all sorts of interesting information. It would be great to know kind of what's, what's, be, what's behind that, what types of experience and whatnot. Um, this is a fun. Okay, so let's look at what we found for the live well. We found a result that was sort of on average on par with the downrigger cable and something that we characterized as, as a medium risk based on the empirical results. So 6.3 on average per live well on island and about one on average in Lake Nolax. And what I find fascinating about this survey, and in many ways this was a motivation for this study, is that one sense of risk uh, based on a whole um, cross-section of experiences, right, might inform where you focus and spend your time um, in terms of cleaning equipment when you when you leave a lake. But but indeed we we wanted to we wanted to test what was really happening when we approach it in a more systematic scientific 
fashion. And so it's those results that kind of gave us the title to this presentation and the main takeaway from this project, which is that line snags spines. So if we combine the angling lines, um, the shallow as well as the downrigger together, and just an average of the, of the three shallow angling lines, not all three, but just an average of the three plus the downrigger angling line, those together count, account for a vast majority, 87% and 88% of all of the brachytrephes ensnared. And so kind of this iconic image that you see here um, of spiny water flea entangling online, in many ways, this, our, our, our research underscores the fact that this indeed is probably the, uh, the most important risk in terms of ensnarement on angling here. Now I wanted to share this with you as well. This was a survey that was conducted, um, not in the same way I just conducted this survey with all of you, um, but a similar type of survey where 824 recreationalists in Ontario uh, were asked about their perception of risk of dispersal and vector load of spiny water flea associated with these different gear types. And interestingly, um, this group of uh, from the public grouped anchor lines and fishing lines and nets in a high risk category. Um, and so their perception of anchor lines was in many ways maybe a little bit more aligned with, with you as a general group and myself included. Um, I, I anticipated and as, as did my, my co-PIs to find more spiny water flea on, on anchor ropes. And, and we didn't, and you know, it, it's interesting. Um, there's a little bit of data there at the bottom of this slide that shows that, that we did find stuff, biota and biofouling on the anchor ropes. We found um, 10 Daphnia across all the anchor ropes and island lake, and we found a variety of, of uh, more benthic invertebrates, isopods, leeches, and mollusks across the, uh, those are total numbers, across the Mill Lakes anchors. And so, you know, we see things on anchors. Um, the biota is there. We're close to those anchors, and, and maybe that gives a sense that the anchors are, uh, are more likely to ensnare, ensnare spiny water flow. The fact that we see biota there indicates that there probably wasn't something toxic about the line material. But I do have to say as a small caveat here that the anchor ropes were deployed in a stationary fashion, and the story could change if, if uh, an anchor was being used in moving water, or maybe even slightly moving water near a lake inlet or a lake outlet. Okay, now I want to dig a little bit deeper here on the angling lines and we're going to conduct one more survey and this is to rank the ensnarement risk of the three different products that we used in the shallow presentation to rank them as low, medium, or high with respect to um, ensnarement. So we'll start with monofilament. And this is comparing one line type to the next. Okay, excellent, medium category. Um, I don't know exactly what that means, but my sense is that with most of you selecting medium, by a small amount, but nonetheless, there's some sense that maybe some of the other line types ensnared more. So we'll take a look at this. All right, so what did we find for the monofilament? Um, I categorize it as high to medium, okay? So I, I think the, the, the bulk of the group um, selected um, in a way that was consistent with the evidence. 18.6 per line in Island Lake, 38.9 per line in Lake Mille Lacs. Okay, let's weigh in now as a group on braided. Okay, hi. All right, so we had, we had uh, votes in each category, but in comparison to the survey on monofilament, more of you voted for high um, 
than uh, than you did for for braided. Okay. And so this is what we found. We found we found low to medium. Okay. So in comparison to monofilament, the contrast was pretty stark in Island Lake. And while there was a, a sort of a numerical difference there in Lake Millac, I'll just tell you that it wasn't statistically significantly different. Those two numbers in Lake Millac, monofilament and braided, they were statistically different in, in Island Lake. I'll say a little bit more about this in just the, as we, once we finish the last survey. So let's do that now for fluorocarbon. Okay, a high um, wins the day there with 39%, but followed closely by medium and low. Okay, so there was a considerable degree of, sort of equity across um, the, uh, the survey there, but certainly more, most in the high category. And that indeed uh, is, what, is what the result showed. So we, we found that in in Island Lake, both monofilament and fluorocarbon, I guess outperformed might not be the best word, but were riskier than braided uh, overall. In Lake Mille Lacs, we found the same thing, both fluorocarbon and monofilament ensnared the most uh, compared to braided, but none of those three numbers in Lake Mille Lacs is statistically different from one another. But not, nonetheless, there's sort of a trend there in both lakes to suggest that the braided product is less likely, less risky than either of the two polymers, monofilament or fluorocarbon. And we don't necessarily know why this is. Um, we've, we've been uh, d discussing a number of different ideas, maybe at the end of the seminar, some of you have ideas about this. Certainly the exterior uh, feels different to the touch. And because of that, we hypothesized that, that possibly groups of spiny water flea are sliding on the lines more, more often on the fluorocarbon than the monofilament and clumping up. And that might uh, help them stay buttoned, sort of, if you will, to the line. There's also an aspect to sort of stretchability, um, which is much less in the braided product than the monofilament and fluorocarbon. And so slight agitation, we don't know, this is just hypothetical, but might tend to flick them off more, more often on the braided product compared to the monofilament and, and fluorocarbon, but that might make for an interesting second study. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now and, um, and just it, it, with, with less discussion and uh, results, talk about the uh, evidence for the other five, four questions that we posed. The second question is, is ensnarement risk affected by lake density? And the answer is yes. And, and sort of here's the evidence. Uh, we found that if you plot up on an X-way plot ensnarement rate, which is number of bithotrephes on all gear per transect against the ambient lake density, you find a positive relationship that's statistically significant and not different between Millax and Island Lake, which is why we combined them here. So this is a single plot with 72 data points. Um, the plot has a slope of about three, intercept of about 22, 22.6. So what this indicates, right, is that in lakes with higher densities of spiny water flea, the ensnarement risk is higher, and even locations and times in lakes with higher spiny water flea density, ensnarement risk is going to be higher. And one of the kind of the the interesting things to keep in mind here is that because of the exponential growth potential of spiny water flea, they do rise and fall in density relatively swiftly throughout a growing season. And so it's not unlikely that a recreationalist would have uh, two very different experiences on the same lake, maybe two to three weeks apart uh, in terms of number of spiny water flea that they see ensnared on their gear, which of course underscores the need um, to stay vigilant, right? To not get complacent and, and bored <laughs> with cleaning one's gear, um, even though you might have had a, a no spiny water flea experience on, on one day, OK? 
okay? Things could change very rapidly um, within, a, within a couple weeks. And, and, um, and maybe this is the evidence for, for some of that. Okay, I wanna circle back now too to this, this idea that we, cap, we studied these two lakes because of their um, fish communities, Island Lake without Cisco and Lake Mille Lacs with Cisco. And th this is the, the, the main difference that we found between the two lakes with respect to their ensnarement. If one looks at total ensnarement of all the gear as a function of density, as I just said, you don't find the difference between the two lakes. But when you start to drill down a little bit more and ask about the different gear types, there's a really fascinating contrast. And the contrast here is between the shallow angling line and the downrigger line. In Island Lake Reservoir, where there's no Cisco, I'll just tell you both day and night, you find more spiny water flea ensnared on the downrigger line than on the shallow angling. Now, part of that might be due to the fact that the downrigger line was just longer than the shallow angling line. So there was more sort of, there was more um, gear out there, if you will, to be ensnared on. But we found a reverse pattern in Lake Mille Lacs. And, and that explanation of the length of line out doesn't hold here. In Lake Mille Lacs, we found both day and night more spiny water flea ensnaring on the shallow angling line than on the down river line. And this at least is um, directionally consistent with the idea that spiny water flea are vertically positioned higher in the water column in Lake Mille Lacs than they are in Ivan Lake. And this, this is a screen capture of a study by Young and Jan in a couple lakes in Ontario. The top panel there is showing those shaded regions where spiny water flea are day and night in Lakes with Cisco. And in Peninsula Lake on the bottom, that's where they layer out in lakes without Cisco. So this is consistent with the idea that the top lake is sort of, you know, is, is a Cisco lake. So maybe that's where spiny water flea are higher in the water column in Lake Mille Lacs, and they're deeper in the water column day and night in, in Island Lake. So this is interesting. This, this is at least, again, is directionally consistent with the idea that every lake isn't the same, and in lakes with a a cold water, a deep cold water zooplanktivore like Cisco, one should be a little bit more concerned about shallow angling lines. And in, in other lakes, those without Cisco, the downrigger angling line. Okay, question four was, is ensnarement risk life stage specific? Um, and when I say life stage, again, I mean these instars, instar one, instar two, and instar three. And we were able to address this for the angling gear that is transcended the entire water column, right? Because when we went out and we measured ambient densities in the lake, um, we had those collections in hand, but those ambient, those collections were from the entire water column. And so we, we had to, we could only pose this question about instar specific ensnarement for equipment that reached the entire distance over which we made those vertical net toes. And for the most part, that just included the, the angling line. That was the only gear that had high numbers. And what this, what this graph is showing, uh, basically, uh, this is fancy thing called Chesson's alpha. And the higher the alpha, what that indicates is that there were disproportionately more of that instar on the angling line than there was at the lake in the lake at the time that we sampled. Okay. A value of 0.33 indicates that what we found on the angling line was equivalent essentially to what, what was in the lake. So the evidence pretty strongly suggests that the larger, longer tail spined instars are proportionately more likely to be ensnared. And this has interesting implications because they're the reproductive stage of the population. And so what we're seeing here is that uh, the animals that are ensnared, at least on this gear type, might be better positioned uh, because of their, their reproductive nature to seed, right, a, a, a new lake with, with propagules. 
Okay, and then moving into the last question, is ensnarement risk time of day specific? So we went out and sampled daytime. Half of our transects were between the hours of 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., and the other half were between the hours of 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. And when you account for background density in the lake, we really didn't find any time of day specific patterns uh, to the ensnarement rate that we were that we were measuring. Okay. There may be something going on there. Um, it may have been that we weren't out late enough uh, on, on, on one or, or both of these lakes uh, to see a pattern. But the upshot is the patterns that we saw and measured, we don't see any influence of time of day on those. Doesn't mean that there isn't one, but we just, we weren't able to detect that. Okay, great. So finally, this is, this is my last slide. And I, I wanted to share this with you because we're, we're pretty darn excited about this. Um, this idea was a culmination of a, a large number of conversation, conversations and, and weigh in by stakeholders. Um, this is one of the outreach products that we're in the process of producing. This isn't a printed Swedish dish cloth, but it's meant to look like one. Um, we're going to uh, produce 8,000 of these uh, in the next couple of months for wide distribution uh, throughout St. Louis County and other parts of the state. Um, this is the message, this is the outreach message that we resolved. And, and again, the idea here isn't, is not to replace okay, any messaging that's out there, but it's to highlight and to underscore um, and to bring attention to the types of equipment that based on our study uh, revealed uh, a considerable number of um, spiny water flea. Now you might ask, well, how about live wells and bait buckets? Boy, it looked like your study didn't show much there at all. And one of the points that was brought to us was that even though certain gear types like live wells and bait buckets might not have bared a lot of ensnarement um, because of the damp wet nature of those vectors they might be more likely to support a living animal uh, over time as it moves from one lake um, to the next but we wanted to really highlight lines and, and and reels that those lines would be brought up on so this product is 75 percent biodegradable 30 percent natural cotton um, I'm not trying to sell you one because if you want one, we'll give you one. Uh, I probably have 8,000 of them. Um, they're eight by seven inches, rectangular. Um, they're, you know, they're used for, for cleaning dishes, but now we're going to use them for cleaning equipment. They're, they're relatively um, soft uh, when, they're, when they're wet, absorbent. Hooks come out of them pretty easily and they float when they're wet. So um, if that's not an advertisement, I don't know what it is. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation. I want to just again thank um, a number of uh, people listed here who are um, invaluable in the field in helping us uh, run, the, run the project. And again, thank St. Louis County um, as well as MACER for sponsoring this project. And I'm uh, happy to take questions. Great, thanks so much, Don. We appreciate that. I know when I first saw yours, I was really shocked by the braided line response in particular as mm -hmm. well. So, mm -hmm. all right, I'm going to um, switch over and share my screen, which has the instructions for our Q&A session. I see that um, many of you have already been dropping some questions into chat. So as a reminder, if you have questions that come up, go ahead and drop them in there. And um, I'm going to start throwing those at Don now. Um, we'll end promptly at two, uh, but Don has offered to answer questions that we don't have time for um, via uh, text. So I'll have a document that will accompany the recording of this at the end. So I'm going to start, Don, with just a couple of questions um, with that, where people are looking for a little bit more background just on the organism itself. Um, and do you know, is there a reason for that hump um, or the little like crook in the long spine on them? Oh, that is a great question. We, um, 
Not necessarily. And so one of the, one of the attributes of, the, um, of development is that that tail spine grows and develops inside the brood chamber of the female. And that is, is a bit of an elbow or a bend point uh, during development. And, and immediately, essentially, upon birth, um, actually maybe slightly before birth, that tail spine uh, sort of straightens out and they actually use it like an epi, if you will, to, to rip their way through the brood chamber to come out. And so it, it might be a vestige of a really important sort of uh, developmental transition point in that tail spine. But otherwise, we don't know of any, any um, sort of adaptive value to that. It is outfitted with these small teeth or serrations that uh, run in opposite directions. Um, we could spend quite a bit of time talking about the anatomy of the tail spine, but I guess the short answer is, other than the development, no. So. Great, thanks. Um, yeah. And could you share how long spiny water flea are able to survive outside of the water? Yeah, right. So we've, we've done some extensive studies on, on the resting egg. And the resting egg is just what's considered to be a dispersal stage, an overwintering stage. Um, and the reason we, we focused on that is because tr traditionally, based on evidence across this group of freshwater zooplankton, the resting egg is much more environmental, is much more tolerant of exposure to chemicals and to, to drying or desiccation. And remarkably, our studies showed that six hours or more of exposure to dry air, right, is enough to render them inviable. They don't hatch. Um, four hours or less of drying, the resting egg does well, okay? Now, the, the animal itself probably has a shorter leash or shorter timeline of survival outside of water, but it really hasn't been tested um, experimentally. One could do that. My guess is probably about a, it's probably minutes um, of, of real exposure uh, is probably gonna kill the animal. But kind of all bets are off again if you can keep them, if you can keep them damp or wet, right? And so um, this is this is that lingering issue with live wells and bait buckets. So, but if you were to dry your equipment overnight, um, that should be sufficient. The recommendation currently is five days, and that's well well beyond what we know and what we think and we know about the uh, timeline of survival for the resting egg or the, the adult organism, yep. All right, great. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a question about your thoughts on the differences that you saw between the monofilament and the braided line, the um, floral line was, um, do, do, do you think there's a visibility issue there that can be contributing to uh, those differences that you saw? It's a really good question. Um, I, I think we would, uh, there's probably some other factors that, that weigh in uh, as well. We, our focus wasn't on necessarily the mechanism. We really didn't know what to, think, to focus on necessarily. I can say, you know, as you, re as you retrieve those, a lot of the animals on those angling lines end up clumping up at the last eyelid of a fishing rod. Um, and so there, there is some sliding that they do, but whether they're doing that you know, in tow is, is sort of a, sort of another, another question there. Um, I don't think visibility is an issue. You know, it, it, the other contrast between the two lakes is their secchi transparency. Island Lake is a tea stained lake with a secchi transparency of about one to two meters. It's a very dark lake. And Mill Axe has a, has a much greater transparency. Um, so if there's any avoidance that might have been going on, you'd actually expect that the numbers ensnared um, as the function of background density would have been different between the two lakes. And, and so we could sort of test for that. And, and I guess you could say that we did. And because we didn't find any difference um, there, um, or the difference was in the direction of, of Mill Lacks, um, more on the shallow angling line than in Island Lake, it kind of goes counter to the visibility issue so we, without our intention of testing that, maybe, maybe we did there. It's also the case that 
they just don't swim fast enough um, to avoid the line coming through the water. Now, may, maybe there's some vibration that they can detect. That's a possibility. Um, but that should be equivalent between the two lakes. So. All right, great, thanks. Uh, that was, I, I was glad that you mentioned the islet because I think that brings us into another question that someone had, wondering if you had checked the reels and were there spiny water flea there or is there a way to know kind of where along that line you typically see them catching? Great question, we did check the reels and occasionally um, we would remove one from the reel when they got into the reel. And so that does happen and it will happen. And depending upon, um, how much abrasion there is of the line against the eyelets when it's reeled in, that could happen potentially more. Um, so that will happen occasionally, but most of ours, most of our collections um, were focused on the, the last eyelet because that's where most of the action was in terms of the spiny water flea. Uh, but that's a, that's a really good point. And that's in fact why in that, in the Swedish dishcloth, we, we use the word real, okay? lines and reels because we don't want, um, we don't want that to be missed uh, as a point of focus uh, for the use of the dishcloth. Yep. Great, so if someone is, is um, using your new cloth, when is the best time to do that wipe down? Would it be while the line is being reeled in or would it, is it okay to just kind of do that once everything's all reeled in and packaged up? Early and often, um, but I don't, <laughs> Yeah, I, it, it's, it's meant for both of those. It's meant to be used, um, you know, there's, there's one aspect of it, right, is, is informational, it's a fun, it's a product, but it's really useful as well. And so uh, if it becomes a problem during the course of, of angling, it, sh it should be used then. Uh, but at the very least, if it's only gonna be used once, right, it should be used uh, as, the, as the recreationalist is leaving the lake draining the live well, using that as a, it has a sponge type feature to it. So they can use it to dry the nooks and crannies of spaces that contain water and wipe down all of their equipment. And then the, of course the towel itself should be dried, right? Because with spiny water flea on the towel now, that presents a potential interesting risk as, as the last, right? vector for uh, for movement from one lake to the next and we, we certainly don't want that to happen and so we included there the fact that that towel should also be addressed um, as a as a point of contact for ensnarement great thank you and um can you share it are do we know if there's any control tools available once spiny water flea are found in a new water body do we have any options there there are no uh, understood options at this point. There's sort of been a lot of people thinking about it. There's some ideas that have been floating around, um, but there is nothing out there currently. We know that some fishes eat them um, and some are better than others at eating them. There's been some interesting studies um, with respect to pumpkin seed sunfish that because of their pharyngeal teeth they're in, in sort of snail eating capacity that they're pre-adapted to eating spiny water flea and shucking the spine. Uh, but it, that's a near shore fish primarily and spiny water flea is a more of an offshore uh, dweller. And so we don't, we don't have anything currently. Um, once, they're, once they're in a lake, they're in a lake short of draining it entirely and drying it out. But that's wholesale destruction to everything. So, but there's, there's people thinking about it. And if you have ideas and you want to share them, I'm all ears. Um, or I'm sure Maserk would be all ears because that's a, that's a common question that comes up. Great, thanks, Don. Mm -hmm. um, so we have just about two minutes left before we need to wrap up. So I think I'm going to transition and give some closing housekeeping items. Um, there are some questions that we haven't had time to get to yet. So like I had mentioned earlier, um, Don has offered to um, answer those for us um, offline later. So once the recording becomes available, um, there will be a link to that document with it as well. So we'll share those then. Um, so I'll, I'll give my thanks um, to Don and, and Val as well for sharing your work with us. We really appreciate that. Um, thanks to everyone who was able to join us for today's webinar. We hope that you enjoyed it. Um, I had mentioned it will be recorded. Showing on the screen now is our YouTube channel. Um, you can get there by going to z.umn.edu slash AISTube. 
Um, you can view our previous webinars on there as long as some other as, as well as some other videos. Um, and this one will be there as well. Um, give us a little bit of time. We take the time to, to do the closed captioning on these um, so that they're more accessible. Um, and that usually takes about a week, but also remember it's a long weekend. So factor that in as you as you time that week out. Um, we'll have that Q&A document available with that. Um, if you have other questions as well showing on the screen are both Don and Val's email addresses and you can reach them there. Um, if you have questions for um, us as the webinar host with the AIS Detectors program, our webinars, other programs or educational materials we have, um, you can reach us as well. Our email is showing on the screen, AISdetectors at umn.edu. Um, and with that, I think I've wrapped up my housekeeping items. So I'll give my final thanks and farewell to everyone. Thanks for joining us and we'll hope to see you on the next one. Thank you.